The uh, husband would tie, um, you know, a rope or halter round his wife's neck and take her to the marketplace and he would offer her for sale. That was Leslie Atkins on the realities of Georgian marriage. So the dishes would be very complex, what are known as made dishes. So dishes that have multiple meats, highly reduced sauces, um, and, and, and rich flavouring. And that was Sarah Pennell talking about food in history. Hello and welcome to the History Extra podcast. My name is Matt Elton and I'm books editor of BBC History magazine, which is the UK's best-selling history magazine. You can find it in all good news agents and on subscription. See historyextra.com slash subscribe for subscription deals. We also have digital editions available for the iPad, the Kindle, the Kindle Fire and Google Play. For details of our digital formats, including price, content and availability, head to historyextra.com slash digital. Anyone who has read Jane Austen's 1813 novel Pride and Prejudice could be fooled into thinking that Georgian marriages were the stuff of great romances full of balls, dancing and beautiful clothes. But, says Leslie Atkins, they could also be unhappy affairs where husbands could dominate their wives and childbirth could deprive a family of a mother. My fellow section editor, Charlotte Hodgman, caught up with Leslie to find out more. So, Leslie, why did people choose to get married in, in Georgian England? And did they have a choice whether they got married or not? I think it's very, a very different society to that of today. Nowadays, we might decide, shall we get married? Shall we remain sing single? Shall we live together? But you were expected to get married then, and you probably couldn't conceive of a future without marriage being part of it. And the most important factor for marriage was finance because you would be very financially insecure if you didn't get married, particularly for women because you couldn't just stay living with your parents for the rest of your life. Inevitably, your parents would, would die and you would be on your own, so you, you would face penury and you couldn't rely on other brothers and sisters for your money. So for a woman, it was critical to get married. And even Jane Austen, who didn't get married, wrote uh, in one letter that single women have a dreadful propensity for being poor, which is a very strong argument in favour of matrimony. Though, again, why she didn't get married, we don't know for certain. But, uh, yeah, if, if, if I was a woman at, it, at that time, I would definitely choose to get married. And was there a sort of a stigma attached to women who didn't get married, aside from financial um, problems? They were called old maids. That was the most common term. And they were pitied, most of them, because being an old maid... You were a figure of fun and people wrote about them and, and one woman said, well, all the children laugh at you and you, you just can't remain being an, an old maid. There, there was some stigma. Uh, it was far worse for a woman to be unmarried. I mean, people like um, Parson James Woodford, who's well known as a diarist, he never got married and I think he probably would have liked to. He just never married the right person. But that was fine for him. He was a man. He would be welcomed into society at people's dinner tables. But it wasn't quite the same for most women, particularly if you didn't have a great deal of money. So, yes, I think that there really was some stigma attached. And what sort of behaviour was deemed appropriate um, in terms of courting a potential spouse? I wish we knew more about that, actually, but considering that most people were lower classes, lower middle classes, I don't think we really know enough about how they courted, how they met each other. The, I mean, Jane Austen's novels, just, just to go back to her, she makes fun of the whole marriage market, but she's talking about the upper end of society, and even for them. They had trouble meeting their partners and the best way to meet people was at dances and at balls. But for 
everyone else, all the lower classes, we really don't know enough. How, how did they get married? Was it the person next door? Did they just meet in the marketplace? Because a lot of them weren't literate, we don't get that sort of information left to us in their letters. So I think we just have to assume that all sorts of things played a part and uh, they, they would get married when it was convenient. Perhaps they had fallen in love. Perhaps it was just finances. Perhaps families pushed them together. But you have to also bear in mind that a lot of boys would be apprenticed to learn a decent trade and most of them were apprenticed at the age of 14 and they weren't actually allowed to be married until their apprenticeships were over and most apprenticeships were for seven years so they couldn't actually get married until their early 20s and so you think of perhaps that people would be married at a very early age, but the average age for marriage in, in George and England was, was in the 20s for, for a first marriage. Okay, and um, Jane Austen's novels famously, there's a lot of people marrying outside of their class. Um, was that typical or were people allowed to, to marry outside of their social class? I think for her novels... Outside of their class up to a point, I think if we looked at those people today and, and compared the income with the lower classes, we would say, mm, well, they're still pretty upper middle class, even if uh, we might think they were out of their class. I mean, some, somebody was saying, well, they can't, they can't marry him because he's only a surgeon, whereas today we might think that a surgeon was quite a good catch. But a class prejudice was rife and it was very much frowned upon to marry outside of your class and actually almost impossible because if you were a wealthy man you probably weren't going to look at a lower class woman who didn't have a dowry unless for some reason you had fallen madly in love with her and eloped to Scotland because your parents maybe wouldn't give their uh, consent otherwise but um it, it was very difficult, and Nellie Wheaton, who uh, came from Lancashire, she remained sing single until her thirties, and in one letter to a friend of hers, she said that you really don't want to marry outside your class because it creates all sorts of troubles, and this was from her own experience as a governess. She was governess to a Mr. Pedder in the Lake District and after his first wife had died, he married his dairy maid and he actually eloped with her to, to Scotland because he knew she, she was very young and he knew her father wouldn't give consent. But Nellie Wheaton could tell that it it wasn't the right thing because all his social class looked down on her and therefore he was socially excluded. They just didn't accept him as an equal after that. Uh, people knew their place and if you try to get a bit uppity and uh, marry above your station, that just was not the right thing to do at all. And, and how common was elopement in, in those days? If you were going to elope, then I think you have to accept you have money or, or one side had money because if you were poor, you wouldn't be able to travel. You wouldn't have the money, um, nor would you be able to, uh, be, or, or you wouldn't be allowed to travel because uh, if you were found outside your parish with no money, you'd be sent back in case you were suddenly uh, a burden on that parish uh, as a pauper. So it was impossible for the poor to travel, um, even if they did want to elope uh, to be married. But um, I don't think we know the, the exact percentage of people who eloped, but they are quite often mentioned in the newspapers. So any newspaper, you'll see some elopement. And by all accounts, some of them were, were successful marriages. And have you found any examples of couples who live together outside of marriage? Was that something that was uh, common? It did happen, but... Again, statistically, um, it, it's difficult to prove. Um, 
marriages um, did have to be recorded, um, obviously, in, in, the, in the church registers at that time. But if you were a couple living together, um, this was a time without contraception. Um, condoms were used with prostitutes, but they weren't used with, with couples. They were to prevent d disease, not to prevent children. And so most couples would end up having children. And this was an age when religious beliefs would deeply held and if you had a child you would want your child to be baptized and the chances are that if you weren't married your clergyman would refuse to baptize the child um, we came across one example um, in the Quantox and there are wonderful diaries of one clergyman William Holland and he was not amused on one Sunday because a couple turned up to be married his clerk had not told him about the marriage for a start and he hated marrying people on a Sunday but he was even less amused when he found they had a bouncing baby <laughs> with them and they wanted this baby to be christened on the very same day as their marriage and he said to them that if he had known that there were people like them living in his parish, he wouldn't have allowed it. And apparently they turned to him and said, well, yes, we, we know that, that those were your views. That's why we've come to be married, because apparently they had only just moved into his parish. And I think if your baby couldn't be baptized, that would be quite a terrible thing for people who did hold um, deep religious beliefs because if the baby died it couldn't be given a, a Christian burial. Um, we do know probably of more examples of mothers who had illegitimate children um, where the fathers weren't known and a lot of of these single mothers, if they didn't have any means of supporting themselves, they could be brought before the parish overseers who try to put pressure on them um, to name the father. And if they discovered who the father was, then the couple were, were often forced to marry, um, literally forced to marry. Um, we, again, another good example is, is from um, Parson James Woodford, and this was a marriage in Ringland in Norfolk, and he married this couple and he said that the man involved behaved in a very unbecoming way and had to be virtually dragged to the altar and I suspect you know I do was virtually dragged out of him he really didn't want to be married but he had to marry because he either had to financially support the child or he had to marry the woman which meant that he had to support her and the child or else he was sent to prison so uh, it was only a problem if the man was already married, then they couldn't force the marriage. I mean, from what you've said so far, it doesn't really sound that marriage was something really, um, something a very happy occasion um, sometimes in Georgian England. Um, do you think people actually expected to, to be happy when they got married or was it something they just had to do? Probably I'm giving the wrong impression because... I'm presenting, you know, a lot of the difficulties of marriage, but I think most people expected to be married. That's what the future held for them. They wanted children. They wanted to stay alive. They wanted to earn a living. They didn't know any better. They weren't looking at it with hindsight from the 21st century. That was how they lived at the time. That was the only choice they had. And most people, of course, were Church of England. Most people would abide by the customs of the day, which meant that they would be married. They would have their children after they were married. Most of them never had sex before marriage. Um, if they did and um, became pregnant beforehand, then often the couples would agree to marry anyway. And probably that was a good thing because it proved that they were fertile um, because uh, a marriage without children would was also a, well, a calamity um, or perhaps one of sadness because you couldn't divorce, you couldn't um, do, do anything else. I mean, w women couldn't go and follow their own careers or, or, or try to, to do other things. So, uh, yeah, I think people just made, made the best of, um, of what life was throwing at them two centuries ago. And nowadays, um, a great deal of planning and expense tends to go into preparing for, for for weddings. Um, was this the same in Georgian England? Was it that same kind of sense of occasion? 
I suspect they would say, yes, we have we have a great sense of occasion, but their occasions were very different to what marriage ceremonies are today. Um, the upper classes might have very lavish weddings, uh, although much of the planning was going really into the life after the wedding ceremony rather than the the ceremony itself it was all to do with how the wealth of two families was coming together, where they were living, the carriages, the houses, the London house, the estates and so on. But for most people, uh, wedding ceremonies were quite modest. Um, the clergyman James Woodford actually wrote in his diary that he was really impressed with one wedding that he conducted, but when you read his diary entry, uh, we probably would think, well, well that was a tiny wedding. Um, he said there were, there were two carriages with liveried servants, and there was one bridesmaid, and there were half a dozen guests, and that was it. And, uh, and some of the guests came back to the rectory and uh, had some cider and cake with him. So, but he was very, very impressed with that. Uh, it just wasn't customary for people to have a big wedding with a lot of guests because uh, you couldn't travel to these weddings with the um, uh, conditions on the roads. So that sort of custom of people coming from all over the country to a wedding just hadn't developed. Uh, weddings were, by and large, local affairs, and if you had... Any sort of celebrations, it might be some dancing or, or wedding breakfast um, and perhaps dinner, perhaps supper afterwards. And, and that was it. And uh, you might think it went off really well. Uh, you might have some uh, really special clothes for the wedding ceremony, but um, if they were special clothes, then afterwards you would cut them down and use them for your Sunday best mm -hmm. because no nothing, nothing was wasted. I think... Uh, Georgian couples would probably be horrified by the amount that is spent on weddings today. And what about things like wedding dresses? You, you mentioned about the clothing. Do people actually have special dresses made for the day? The wealthier people uh, did, and uh, white wedding dresses were coming into fashion, um, and sometimes for the bridesmaids as well. But otherwise, it was perfectly acceptable to wear your best clothes and um, uh, anything, you know, you could wear your Sunday best. I think most of the expenditure actually went into the woman's trousseau, the, the clothing that she would wear afterwards um, in her married life and all the other linen that she would require um, in her married life. And have you found any interesting local customs that surrounded children marriages? I think there are absolutely huge numbers of them, and far, I mean, we, 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 you get, you get, wed, you get uh, sort of customs and superstitions on how to find a partner, and then you get some of them um, for the actual day, and uh, and then some of the things that were, you know, done done afterwards. So if you were trying desperately to find your spouse, then one of the um, customs was avoid walking under a ladder because that will prevent you being married over the next year. Which, right. um, <laughs> Um, and then at the wedding, there were all sorts of customs which they did, which would help other people then to be married. Um, and a lot of the customs um, still continue to some extent today. So a lot of them involve wedding cakes, um, but they tended to do strange things with the wedding cakes. So they would... Um, break them up and scatter them amongst the crowd um, and uh, or pass them through the wedding ring, which is very difficult to visualize because it must have been tiny pieces of cake they were they were putting through, but it was uh, one of the things is if you were again trying to find a, a husband or, or wife um, if you took a piece of the wedding cake and put it under your pillow, you might then dream of your future spouse. In your um, in your the feature that you've written for us, um, you mentioned smock weddings, which um, is quite an interesting concept. Could you perhaps explain what that was? Yes, it's uh, where a um, wife to be did not want 
debt in her wedding, she um, would go dressed in virtually nothing. Now, quite often, the woman involved would be a widow, and her husband had left behind uh, a lot of debts which she was unable to pay. And if she had met somebody that, um, that she wanted to marry, um, her new husband wouldn't want her husband's debts. So it was believed that if she went to the church, because, you know, bear in mind, um, virtually all weddings took place in a church so she would go to the church and then take off all her clothes and then proceed to the altar um, in absolutely nothing I mean they do talk of, of these women as being naked and yet I think that term actually means she still had a shift on because in other reports they say yes she took off all her clothes except for her chemise or her smock um, which was the same thing it was basically what, what we would probably now call a um, you know a long vest or a petticoat and uh, and yet you, this, this was shocking to people because you you get a lot of these um, reports in newspapers and uh, there was one occasion where the clergyman refused to marry the couple because because they were doing this. On an, on one occasion, we came across um, the woman was marrying um, a man who himself had a lot of debts. So she went and stripped herself, as they called it, um, and. Uh, it, it wasn't recognized in law, but it was a, a custom, and people believed this to be the case. And, and after the, the wedding, um, were husbands and wives expected to be faithful to each other, or was it acceptable for, say, a man to have a mistress? From what we've you know, seen in, in various records, um, most people would remain faithful in, in their marriages, um, but it was far easier for a man to um, commit adultery than a woman. He would have more opportunity. He would be out of the house much more. And uh, for wealthier men, they would be able to afford to keep uh, a mistress. And it wasn't always frowned upon. Um, even in, you know, a clergyman's diary, you, you get things like, oh, met, you know, Mr. So-and-so with his mistress when they knew him to be married. And they never made any adverse comment on it. Um, men were just allowed to keep mistresses um, as long as it didn't affect the marriage. But I suspect most people, you know, wouldn't want to do that and they did love their wives um, if the woman was acting in the same way then that was grounds for divorce and uh, she would lose you know if, if 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 her husband divorced her which of course was rare because it was so expensive but if he divorced her she would then lose everything whereas it was well nigh impossible for her to divorce him for the um, for, for, for the uh, same behaviour. Real double standards. So it was possible to leave your spouse then if, if the marriage turned out to be unhappy? It was possible to divorce your woman. You would have to involve um, your, your, your wife. It was you, you would have to involve the church courts and then get uh, an act of parliament. And that was very costly, very rare. And for the wife, it meant losing your children because they didn't belong to her. They belonged to the husband. Um, and uh, a, d a divorce was just impossible. Um, the proper divorce law, of course, didn't come in until um, much later on. And uh, if your marriage was unhappy and both sides agreed, you could separate and there were legal forms of separation. You could draw up a, a deed of separation, but you couldn't remarry. That was impossible, but that wouldn't um, mean you couldn't go and live with somebody else. That, 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 that was possible, but, um, but it came a, a bit complicated. Um, I think the most common thing for um, really difficult um, weddings was just to put, for, or difficult marriages, was for people to put up with it. But the most common form of divorce for the lower classes was for a man to sell his wife. <laughs> and it, it just seemed bizarre, but they really believed it was a legal form of divorce. And you get... Um, a lot of reports of these sales of uh, of wives in the newspapers, and uh, one um, clergyman, John Brand, actually said, you know, the, the vulgar class um, 
very often um, divorced by, by this method and, and, and they think it's legal but of course it's not and what happened is that the uh, husband would tie um, you know, a rope or halter round his wife's neck and take her to the marketplace and he would offer her for sale and uh, if somebody agreed to buy her and perhaps um, any children involved then um, then off they would go with the new husband uh, in some cases it does seem as if it was something prearranged I mean maybe they couldn't stand each other and yet he knew that um, you know the farmer down the road needed a nice strong wife and uh, and he was willing to pay a pound for her and so it was agreed and they would meet up at the marketplace and uh, and uh, the transaction was done but in other cases it really does seem that the woman was taken and auctioned and sometimes they both mutually agreed that this is what would happen that she would be taken but others she she obviously wasn't happy. That was author and historian Leslie Adkins. Leslie and her husband, Roy, have written a survivor's guide to Georgian marriage in our July issue, out now. Their most recent book is Eavesdropping on Jane Austen's England, How Our Ancestors Lived Two Centuries Ago, published by Little Brown. Before our next interview, I'd like to quickly mention that extra tickets are now on sale for our History Weekend Festival taking place in the historic Wiltshire town of Malmesbury from the 25th to the 27th of October. We've seen huge interest, so we're delighted to announce that we've agreed with Malmesbury Abbey that we can hold parts of the event inside their beautiful building. This means that we can now offer for sale tickets for some of the events that were previously sold out. For full details and ticket information, please visit historyweekend.com. Food has featured in almost every aspect of human society since prehistoric times from famines and feasts to dieting and domesticity. To coincide with the Institute of Historical Research's annual summer conference, which takes place this week, themed around food in history, Charlotte Hodgman spoke to Sarah Pennell from the University of Roehampton about changing attitudes to food in the early modern period. So, Sarah, probably the first thing to establish is, is what exactly is food history? Um, the problem with the idea of food history is that different people think it's different things. Um, most directly, it can be simply the history of food, mm -hmm. you know, food stuffs, where it comes from, um, and so on. But I think a more sophisticated take on that is comes out of sort of anthropology and social sciences, where one is looking at food ways. So the trajectory of food from production through to consumption, and not just an economic take on that or a, a social history take on that, but including cultural, you know, historical, anthropological investigations too. So rather than history of food, uh, we're looking at history and food or food in history um, I think is probably the, 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 the most useful way of constructing that term uh, thinking about the ways in which food has influenced uh, particular developments particular trade networks for example uh, looking at the way in which in terms of urbanization, how food provision within newly urbanizing settings changes people's attitudes towards food, how they use food in their own homes and so on. Um, so food history can be a many, it's a variegated thing. And you, you uh, focus predominantly on the early modern period. Yes. And um, what sort of types of food were people eating during this, this time? Well, the exciting thing about the early modern in um, uh, my interest in food is because, of course, it's a, it's a fast-changing uh, period in terms of the types of foods available, the ways in which food was accessed by larger a range of society, not just elites, but also new mercantile uh, middling sorts in uh, urban centres. Obviously, it's still predominantly for the majority of the English population. I use English very particularly there because there are very different things going on in Scotland, in Ireland, and indeed even in Wales. So at the moment, let's just keep it at England, is that it's still a highly grain-based diet, grain both in terms of the bread that's the sort of 
starch mainstay, but also in terms of what's being drunk, which is obviously grain based as well. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion in hi historical accounts of uh, food consumed as to the role of meat. Um, but again, more recent historical investigations, both in the late medieval period into the early modern, have, have complicated that again. It's not just, you know, did people eat meat, but what sort of meats were available, what sort of cuts, what sort of types of meats were available to what sections of society. And then we've got, obviously, what have often been called the new groceries um, by people like Carol Shamus coming in from not just the New World, but from the Levant, because coffee, of course, is not a New World product, uh, sugar coming in in much larger quantities. It's there in the medieval period, absolutely, but it's coming in from the middle of the 17th century in much larger quantities from the new Caribbean colonies. But alongside that, we've got more um, mundane, if you will, uh, foodstuffs, or which become mundane uh, by the end of the 18th century, like potatoes, um, like rice. Again, rice not entirely new in this period, but it's a, a, it's very interesting to see how much more widespread it is in terms of recipes and and in household accounts. It's a, again, it's quite diverse. Obviously, one has to be uh, attend to what sort of group we're talking about socioeconomically, where in the country we're talking about. That's a, that's why I'm sort of very specific about England, and even within England, you know, the regionality of of, of diet of what's available agriculturally um, is still we're not. It's it's becoming a much more integrated trading system domestically, so that Cheshire cheese, for example, is very, very popular in London. It's, it's traded quite widely rather than just being something people in Cheshire ate. Um, so the, the great unknown is really because of the source materials. Really, we have very little grasp still of day-to-day -day intake even at the highest echelons, um, because without certain types of sources, you know, we're only getting textual uh, records of high days and holidays, those times in which food is scarce, you know, when it's not there. Um, but actually what the, what the more, you know, everyday, if you will, experience of food consumption is, is still fairly difficult to access for us. So what sort of sources are food historians looking at? Um, well, traditionally, it's been both prescriptive sources, by which I mean uh, texts like uh, manuscripts, uh, published works, of course, cookery books or books of cuisine and um, regimen are amongst the earliest published books. Um, after the expansion of printing, as well as domestic papers, so household accounts, bills, receipts, etc. That's the sort of core. But I think what has, what has really expanded in the past 20, 30 years is a sort of very innovative use of a, a, a range of other materials from the archaeological, so looking at seed and bone remains in, from um, cesspits, for example, through to material culture, which is one area I'm very interested in looking at, the types of food good um, that people equipped their kitchens with, that, you know, laid their tables with, and so on, as a way into how they prepared their food, and so on. Obviously, imagery is uh, very important, not so much as obviously documenting what people ate, coming back to the who ate what when, but representing what was important about foodstuffs or particular ways of presenting food. Um, and then literary representations as well. So I think in the past 20 years, there's been some very interesting work, for example, Joan Fitzpatrick's work on food in Shakespeare um, and food in Renaissance literature being very influential. 
Um, at the same time, um, there's still a, a very strong strand of uh, what I would call uh, quantitative um, history based on um, prices, uh, calorific intake, that sort of thing. I think uh, Craig Muldrew's work on the food, uh, the diets of the labouring um, sorts across the 16th, 17th and early 18th centuries has been incredibly important um, in the past five years. And from your research, have you seen that people were aware of things like dietary needs? I think, I think uh, we underestimate uh, both contemporarily to our own, actually how important food is to us, and therefore we, we perhaps have tended to um, minimise our expectations of where food lay in people's um, imaginary, not just their imaginary, but in their in their daily practice. You know, food, diet, or let's give it its proper term, regimen, is one of the key non-naturals in the sort of medical uh, understanding of the body and its maintenance in the early modern period. So having the right balance of foodstuffs relative to your uh, bodily makeup within the um, humoral system was incredibly important. I think to all but those who really didn't care where their next mouthful came from, from unless, you know, except that they had something to eat. Um, so it, it, the way in which that humoral um, uh, understanding of what people put into their bodies structures food is Again, something that we are beginning to understand much more about through the work of people like Ken Albala, um, but also through looking at recipe collections, household accounts. Once you start to understand uh, not just seasonality, very important, but also who is in the household, who might be eating for particular conditions. You know, if you have somebody who's suffering from... Um, uh, a particular melancholy, for example, you know, you might be seeing in the household accounts, you know, purchasing of foodstuffs that are going into not medications, but into dishes which were deemed important to uh, ameliorate or, or, or at least mitigate that melancholy. So I think food was incredibly important. Obviously, it's very important as it's a life necessity. So going back to those people who really you know, just were after where the next meal was coming from, it is very clear that uh, the absence of food or perceived absence of food was politically extremely sensitive issue. That's why we have uh, things like uh, the books of orders in times of dearth during um, Charles I's reign uh, in order to help the um, flow of grain uh, into needy communities, not have it been sort of hoarded by uh, middlemen and so on. And again, whilst you know, perhaps we've moved away in, in, in recent years from a focus on dearth and famine in, in England, I mean, it really does cease to be a frequent occurrence in the early modern period. Obviously, elsewhere in Europe in the early modern period, you know, famine and dearth are still you know, very live issues um, and ones around which agency of the lower orders is, 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 is much more visible. I mean, what you were saying about eating for certain conditions, yes. you, know, you mentioned melancholy, mm. that's, that's very interesting. I mean, is there anything that you found that was kind of um, recommended back then that we kind of still use today? Have they sort of hit on anything accurate? Well, I think, I think again, that's a, an area in which uh, historians of medicine as well as historians uh, you know, interested in the culinary um, at preparations are beginning to understand how, even if it's not, you know, it's not in the in the in the form of you know the sort of objective, so-called objective scientific, you know, understandings of the components of particular foodstuffs, there was a, a 
a very sophisticated understanding of the ways in which, for example, lettuce. Lettuce is a, is a fascinating thing. I mean, lettuce is described in herbals like Gerard and Culpepper as very milky and very, if you eat too much lettuce, it's going to sort of send you to sleep. <laughs> um, and it's, and, and as well as being other things, there are many other things lettuce would do to you, especially if you ate too much of it. Um, there have been studies in which there are, there's, active components of lettuce which you know do sort of calm things down if you will so I think that sort of the active what we would now call active components or even more faddishly you know sort of nutraceuticals you know the power food element I think it, it, it is understood and there are some very interesting ways in which you know modern investigations of the active elements in foodstuffs are bearing out some of this, not just early modern, but, you know, even class, you know, sort of classical understanding of how these um, plant materials, grains and so on, uh, worked. Of course, there, there are some, the, 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 what's very interesting is when you've got new foodstuffs entering into the sort of culinary lexicon is to how you fit those in to an existing structure, you know, like this. So how do you, how do you deal with the potato? when it starts being, you know, grown and consumed. And it's and there's some very interesting um, discussions of whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, going to provoke lust or whether it's going to do... It's, you know, you basically try to compare a new foodstuff to something like it and then fit it into the lexicon. And I find that very interesting, particularly looking at recipe collections, is to how people begin to use these new ingredients because that's what they are, they're new ingredients. So to take the potato, you know, when it first arrives on our shore, it's, it's treated like you would existing roots, so things like skirrets or parsnips, and used in the same way. And those were used in sweet dishes, tarts, and pies, and so on, um, not mashed as a vegetable, um, as we you know, come to tend to eat it now. Chocolate as well, very interesting, because it comes in as a beverage, and a medical beverage is that. It's very much constructed in the 1660s as a sort of very good for you. Um, but actually in recipe collections, you don't see very many recipes for preparing it as a drink. It's only really after the beginning of the 18th century, have the influence of French, very high French cuisine, where chocolate is being used pretty much as we might use it now as a, as a, a flavouring, particularly for sweet dishes. So again, tarts and puddings and so on. Very, very interesting. There's a lot more work to be done on those sorts of the acculturation, if you will, of new foodstuffs. And, and were people as subject to dietary the fads and fashions and things mm. like that that we seem to be today? Well, I think we need to be careful about what, what we actually mean by diet. I mean, in the early modern period, really, until uh, the, the middle of the 18th century, the idea of dieting, you know, body reduction, is completely non-existent, pretty much. I mean, there are certain medical practitioners like George Cheney, who was a very famous and fashionable bath physician who makes a name for himself partly because he, he loses a lot of weight and counsels some of his patients, clients, uh, to follow a sort of reducing re regime. But that's very unusual. We have to understand diet as regimen. And whilst there are fads, there are certainly fads. They are not fads followed as, I think, we might view today many fads are coming out of, on the one hand, they're coming out of, of changing ideas about nutrition. And I think, you know, the concept of nutrition is non-existent in the early modern period. You know, to understand nutrition as a scientific way of understanding food consumption, it's, it, 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 it's not there. But fads as in, you know, who's eating what, definitely we have wonderful um, records only partially in the public domain, unfortunately, but of uh, a, a Scottish gentlewoman at the end of the 17th century 
beginning of the 18th century, who pretty much writes down every dinner party she goes to. Um, and, and a sort of some, some rather waspish comments on who served what and how, in order probably to sort of make sure that when she's inviting people around uh, for a, uh, a fine supper, that she either outstrips them, um, doesn't make the same mistakes, or, or make sure she's following the right ways of presenting, make sure she's not being seen as, as serving up something that is not absolutely à la mode. And I use the term à la mode because obviously the, the influence of French cuisine at the highest echelons of society uh, towards the second half of the 17th century and into the 18th is well known, um, but it was very real as well. <laughs> So if I was a wealthy person throwing a, a dinner party in the early modern period, what, what should I have on my table? I think if we were thinking about the 1660s, which is, you know, it's a very vibrant, febrile time for food, partly because it's really the period in which we, we start to see uh, a growing number of uh, food publications, recipe collections and so on appearing in print. Um, Obviously, there will be a, a French influence. If you are someone like Elizabeth Tolomash, Countess of Dysart, living at Ham House in the 1660s and 1670s, you would definitely want to have a French cook, um, because that mocks you out as a member of courtly society. Therefore, if you have a French cook, you are trying to follow French fashion. So you're not just the published uh, French cookery books, um, of which there are a couple in translated into English already by the 1660s, but also styles of setting uh, that fine food out. So the dishes would be very complex, what are known as made dishes. So dishes that have multiple meats, highly reduced sources, um, and, and, and rich flavourings. It's, it's about the complexity as well as the, the, the variety of the ingredients that you're putting into these made dishes. So ragouts and fricassees are very um, typical of that sort of cuisine. But also a uh, beginnings of what by the 18th century is, is recognisably dessert growing out of the Jacobean banquet, which is the, the, the sort of after-dinner course, if you will, uh, of sweetmeats and uh, sort of, again, medicalised digestive elements. But by the end of the 17th century, beginning to get the dessert as a, as a lavish setting out of you know, candied fruits, ice cream is a, one of those novel preparations which at the very highest tables you would be hoping to serve forth and impress your guests at this magical cold uh, uh, preparation served forth to stimulate not just taste buds but conversation. So it sounds like meals were sort of cultural experiences as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Obviously, they are opportunities for display and not just display of your gold gilt plate and your, um, uh, you know, your wonderful glassware and uh, obviously cutlery becoming much more uh, diversified, your napery, you know, your napkins folded into elaborate shapes and so on. So there's that element of a dining experience. But then the thing that is most difficult to recapture is the, is the ephemeral additions of what the food looks like as well and how, when it's placed on the table, when it's served forth, what is role does that play in stimulating discussion and exchange? And again, it's, it's, it's the, the eating experiences as performance, not just performance for, for an audience, but for the participants as well. I mean, they are, they're both audience consumers, participants. Um, but there are certain other resonances of, of, the, of the shared meal, 
which we mustn't forget for the early modern period. And, and key amongst those is the, is the religious dimension. Every meal is, in effect, you know, a performance of the Eucharist. You know, it, it's, a, it's a communion around food. Um, and, of course, with the seismic religious shifts across the early modern period, the ways in which food practices with, are, are reconfigured within the new religious uh, structures of Protestantism. Um, it's very interesting. It's because Protestantism is a much more domestically rooted religion in some respects, the way in which saying grace over food and the ways in which particular foodstuffs can become imbued with values across the liturgical calendar, I think is, is, is something, again, which is much more visible in our historical understanding of food consumption. One area which, I, I, whenever I mention it, audiences always sound a little bit surprised at is, is the way in which in the post-Reformation country like England, uh, we still continued to fast on a regular basis. And of course, fasting is, is, is about food, or rather it's abstinence from it. And that even unto, unto the present day, the ways in which, you know, why does pretty much every uh, school dinner on a Friday comprise fish fingers or some form of fish? Well, it's, a, it's, it's that sort of residual um, ritual around the uh, fish days, which Elizabeth I really reinstated, partly for economic reasons, to support the fishing fleet, but also one has to understand that the, the need to placate a society which has made this shift from, you know, Catholicism to Protestantism in not very long space of time. And to see fasting as one of those practices, again, that can bring people together to concentrate the mind around key times of stress, collective stress, and also the need to sort of commemorate events. So, for example, the execution of Charles I, which takes place on the 30th of January, 1649, is commemorated for a long time afterwards with a public fast every year, whereby people were asked to abstain from food and ideally put whatever money they weren't spending on food that day into the collection at church where they were supposed to attend a special fast sermon. So, yes, fasting is one of those activities which is culturally very significant in the early modern period, is about the centrality of food in daily life, but about, again, which perhaps people wouldn't think automatically of being food history. No, no, you're right. Um, <laughs> and, and behind the scenes, how was food being prepared? I mean, what would a 16th century kitchen have looked like, for example? Well, a 16th century kitchen, obviously, it depends where we're, where we're standing in terms of social scale and even where we are in the country. But kitchens were and are, I would contend, very multifunctional spaces. A 16th century kitchen would have been dominated by its hearth, which would have been an open hearth, around which would have been arrayed a fair number of cooking implements. But it, the kitchen could also be the place where there may be a bed. It may also be where you eat. It almost certainly where you uh, might also work, uh, depending on the type of labour you did tend your child, um, they're, they're busy, busy spaces. And when we look at inventories, probate inventories, lists of uh, domestic chattels uh, left by people on their deaths, kitchens often throw up some very interesting elements alongside a diversifying array of cooking implements, which in and of itself can tell us something about changing habits, but things like Bibles, clocks, you know, prints, pictures and so on, which, which 
tell us something about the social life in that space, as well as the labouring life, which of course is very important. Across the sort of 250 years between 1600 and 1750, there are some very seismic changes in the technology of kitchens, even non-elite kitchens, uh, one of which, of course, is the adoption of coal as a cooking fuel, uh, which is widely adopted in urban centres like London, even, you know, by the beginning of the 17th century. And, of course, coal um, has its advantages in being it, it creates a, a fiercer heat. It also produces other problems, soot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it means that you're cooking in a different way on that open hearth. Um, so you start to get coal grates and the biggest sort of, if you, if you like, the microwave of the late 17th <laughs> century is the roasting jack. Because you are, a, there's a more concentrated heat coming out of your coal fire. Clockwork technology is becoming more widely available and cheaper. And so you have these mechanical wind up jacks of various complexity that basically turn your roast joint for you. And that's creating some interesting new dynamics in the kitchen. Because if you're not having to sit there roasting, you know, turn your when it's changing diets, people are roasting when they didn't roast before. Um, but it also is a, is a time saver. So what are you doing when you're not turning your spit? Because somebody's, something is doing it for you. Um, so that, I find those changes absolutely fascinating, as well as the you know, coming in of sort of more and more specialised equipment. So looking at inventories at the end of the 17th century and into the 18th century, some fascinating little things that tell us how people's uh, domestic diets are changing. So patty pans, which are little, little metal uh, pans for making little pies, cake hoops to make cake, so your, your cake tin effectively. Lots and lots of fascinating little objects, which unfortunately are mostly lost to us now because they are, you know, so mundane, if you will, um, and highly used that they simply don't survive um, in any great number to, for people like me to drool over in museum collections. That was Sarah Pennell on food in the early modern period. Sarah is a senior lecturer in early modern British history at the University of Roehampton. She is co-editor of Reading and Writing Recipe Books, 1550 to 1800, published by Manchester University Press. You can read some recipes from the early modern period, including a remedy for piles, at historyextra.com slash food. And that's almost all for this week. Do get in touch with your views on podcast at historyextra.com and we'll do our best to read out some of your messages in future episodes. We're also, of course, on Twitter at History Extra and on facebook.com slash History Extra. Next time we'll be featuring Robert Hutchinson discussing the Spanish Armada, recorded at BBC History Magazine's Tudor Day. And I'll be speaking to the director of a dig that's been discovering fascinating new insights into Iron Age life. So join us for that if you can. The History Extra podcast was recorded in Bristol and produced by Jack Letcher.